someone on the other side of things, someone coming from my background of you know powerlifting or someone coming from weightlifting or CrossFit or whatever, they might have physical abilities that far outpace their jujitsu skill. So while they have normally been lifting four times a week or five times a week, and, and now they start doing jujitsu, they're probably not going to be able to keep lifting four or five times a week. And they don't need to if succeeding in jujitsu is their, is their objective. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Chad Wesley Smith. A quick reminder for those that enjoy this podcast, please take 30 seconds and leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and subscribe to the YouTube channel. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me continue to bring on amazing guests. Also, there are now timestamps in the show notes, so feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Chad Wesley Smith is the founder of Juggernaut Training Systems, Juggernaut AI app, and the Juggernaut BJJ app, which I now use for my strength and conditioning specifically for jiu-jitsu. Previously, Chad was a national champion collegiate shot putter, professional strongman, power lifter, and owner of a 970-pound back squat with sleeves, 567-pound bench press, and an 815-pound deadlift, which, if you're unfamiliar with strength and conditioning, is insane. As a coach, Chad has helped not only UFC fighters, strongman competitors, weightlifters, and powerlifters achieve elite success, but he has personally seen to the strength and conditioning of some of jiu-jitsu's biggest names, including Otavio Sousa, Romulo Bajal, Felipe Pena, Neiman Gracie, and Philippe De La Monica. As a special promotion, Chad and Juggernaut Training Systems is offering a 10% off for life discount for their training apps. All you have to do is use the code MAIN at checkout to get 10% off for life or simply check out the show notes because I put the code in there. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Without further ado, Chad Wesley Smith. Reading about your history as a competitive athlete, as a shot putter, as a weightlifter, a powerlifter, I came across this this bit on this site. It said Juggernaut defines an expert as someone who has done it themselves with success, coached others to success, and studied the principles which make someone successful in a given field. And I I love that, but I'm wondering for you, why is it important to define an expert in this capacity, given what you do and given the offerings that you have? Yeah. So what we're really looking for there is is two of the three, because you know. Competing at a high level, of course, is genetics can be a big part of that, and you don't have to have genetics to have the understanding of it. Coaching, you know, a coach in and of itself, I guess you could just be a great recruiter uh, or lucky with the people that uh, you interact with. So, and uh, the you could just get lucky, and then the education part of it or the the studying part of it, you could have only you know kind of theoretical uh, knowledge, but never applied it practically. Uh, but we find if, if someone has two of those three, uh, two of those three categories taken care of, then they're, they're probably very, very well qualified to, to do what they are doing. Uh, you know, just the, the internet has democratized information and fitness so much that it's easy for someone who, you know, looks great, but maybe that just, you know, the way that, that they're meant to look or someone who, you know, can talk a good game, um, but has never really had to put it into practice to gain a big following and, and uh, to gain, you know, the trust of people that maybe they sh don't deserve to have. So I think, uh, you know, I, I always said that there's, there's two kind of coaches. There's coaches, there's internet coaches who only just talk about this stuff on the internet. <laughs> and then there's, coaches, there's coaches who put stuff on the internet, people who are really living it day to day in the trenches, and then they choose to share that expertise uh, with a wider, wider audience. And then certainly there's coaches who, you know, are just doing their thing and being awesome and don't care to write about it or talk about it. And they're, they're too busy actually coaching. Um, so, you know, we try and deal with, with mostly the, the latter two examples there. Well, you, you guys have done such a fantastic job with, with Juggernaut and then the expansions into Juggernaut AI and Juggernaut BJJ. And if you, for those listening, if you go online and even what you put um, 
up on for free, you know, on YouTube and even on your own site, it's very methodical, right? It's very clear that you've you put in the time, you've spent time as an athlete, but you've also developed a knack for the science side of it, and you have an ability to communicate and take complex ideas that, as strength and conditioning coaches, we're exposed to, but deliver them to a way that someone could be just curious about, hey, what are good exercises that I can implement to help reduce the risk of injury in jiu-jitsu? And they can come across this stuff and actually it hits home. And the reason I love this, that that is on your site as like a prerequisite for what you're looking to create is for everything that you just said. The internet is littered with absolute trash just because someone has found a way to create a following without having any real grit behind it and experience. And it's confusing for people that are looking for information, right? If you're actually trying to figure something out on your own and, and you don't have access to top level coaches, you can't jump into Cal strength for strength and conditioning, or you don't have that ability and you turn to the internet, you're just left with all this. I feel like this should be kind of the prerequisite for if you're going to provide training information online, you need to hit a few of these categories. Yeah, you know, it, it would be great if, if uh, that, I, I'd like that there to exist something like that. And then I did, I'd like there to be some sort of, uh, you know, captcha process for people who want to comment on yes. things online in which they need to provide some sort of credential. But uh, that's you know. actually a, a, that is a genius idea. <laughs> if there was the, I am not a robot for wanting to provide like snarky feedback on some yes. thing that you don't know anything about. Just a brief quiz or something. Um, but yeah, one, one can hope as you're t from when you decided to stop competing as a shot putter, how did you find And actually maybe a better question is first, maybe we can define what is powerlifting and what is weightlifting. Yeah, and then so we can talk about how you ended up in those two realms. Yeah. So I threw the shot put, uh, from age eight until 23, almost 23, um, uh, Went to the University of California, Berkeley, Cal on a track scholarship, then ended up at a very small school called Concordia here in Orange County, California, uh, through 6310 as a collegiate, which is NAIA champion twice, uh, and I think third or fourth among all collegiates that year, D1, D2, everything combined. And then through for a year as a post collegiate, uh, with, you know, a very dark horse Olympic hopeful probably through 65, seven, um, with a 16 pound shot as a post collegiate, which I think at the time for the, would have been a B standard for the 2012 Olympics, but the U S is uh, extremely stacked in shot putting. In fact, we have the, uh, the three best shot putters of all time, uh, in the U S and two of them currently competing. Um, so, you know, at that, at that point I had started juggernaut in right after I graduated college in 2009. So I was competing in track, you know, coaching, working 70 to 80 hours a week. And so decided, all right, I need to take a step back from uh, competing. Also my, my coach had uh, passed away from, from cancer. So I, I was like, no coach working a ton and I'm already kind of behind these guys. So let's, uh, let's just focus on the work side of things, but I was already really strong. Uh, and I was sponsored at the time by Elite FTS, so I figured, well, I'm already really strong, so let's see what powerlifting is all about. You know, powerlifting is a squat, bench, deadlift, one rep max, uh, the total combined for the three wins. Weightlifting, snatch, clean, and jerk, the total for the combined two win. Uh, you know, in hindsight, I kind of wish I would have switched to weightlifting at the time because I was super, super explosive. Uh, though I, I didn't do very much weightlifting as part of my shot put training, which is a bit rare, though I had cleaned power cleaned 195 kilos then and and i did clean jerk 180 kilos when i was like 19 but you know i was squatting 725 so like 330 kilos Wait, you're, sorry real quick you're just out of bed you're just clean and jerking 190 kilos and you're that's not really even your discipline correct uh clean jerked clean jerked 180 kilos 180 okay training training yeah the lifts more, but still in the context of shot putting. And then after about two years, really not doing any cleans, I sort of just, well, let's see, let's see what I can do one day. And I power cleaned 195 kilos then, but you know, wow. I also 
well, it was 290. I had a 36 inch vertical and right. it's squat 725. So, you know, there was a lot working in my favor there. Um, so I kind of wish I would have switched to weightlifting then instead of powerlifting, because if it didn't work out, I could have, you know, pivoted to powerlifting later, but the, the reverse right. doesn't work out as well typically. But anyway, I started powerlifting then in uh, fall of 2010. Did pretty well for myself as a powerlifter, competed for six years, uh, ended up squatting 440 kilos, 970 pounds um, as a super heavyweight, benched 567, deadlifted 815. Also uh, competed in strongman, was a won nationals in strongman in 2012, so became a professional strongman with that. Um, and then coached a ton of, uh, you know, all your favorite powerlifters pretty much. Uh, Coach two thousand plus pound squatters. I think the only person to do that for raw powerlifting, a uh, bunch of you know eight hundred plus squats and deadlifts. IPF champion uh, in uh, women's uh, tested powerlifting. Uh, so you know big ones, small ones, young ones, older ones, men, women. Coach them all. So if you have the the prerequisites of a powerlifter, you have quite a substantial amount of strength across these three movements. And if we look at something like strongman, I've always been curious, what is the the transition like from that and what things carry over really well and what things are kind of left by the wayside? Because if, if I'm thinking about it, strongman is going to be a lot of like odd position, carries, lifts, putting things up and over at different targets, uh, throwing. So it's a, a unique blend of being insanely strong, but then also being able to take that strength and move it dynamically, which is some of what we see in Olympic weightlifting, except it's confined to these very three specific movements. So how did you, how was that initial transition into strongman? And maybe you can d describe a little bit what strongman is for those that are unfamiliar with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, strongman is, is heavy shit fast. That's what you see on TV sometimes, you know, lifting refrigerators and the big rocks and all that stuff. Um, for me, it was a pretty simple transition. I was already very explosive and very athletic from my, you know, lifetime of track and field. Um, and then I was really strong from powerlifting. So I just kind of put them together, um, and, you know, practice the, the technique of the events. But when I won nationals, I it was only my fourth, my fourth strongman show. I'd been competing for about nine months. Um, eight months, actually, I think, uh, so yeah, the, the, you know, events all have their own technique, but because every show that you do might have a different, might have different events at them, you gotta be adaptable and <clears throat> other people who are great technicians of strongman, certainly, but <clears throat> because every event you do has different, has, or different, every show you do has different events and they might change day of like, oh, we couldn't get this piece of equipment or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's raining. So this event's not going to work cause it's going to be too slick. You know, whatever, whatever it is, <clears throat> the, my best advice, if you want to do strong man is to be a strong man or strong woman. Um, and as a prerequisite, <laughs> yeah, you know, you can, <laughs> if that, that gets you through a lot. If you're, if you're strong and in, you know, decent strong man shape, which is like, can go really hard for a minute. Uh, you're going to do pretty well for yourself. What, how do you stave off injury in a sport like that? Or, or I guess in, in powerlifting as well. I mean, the, the volume alone can be detrimental. You see a lot of people get injured just in the training, not necessarily in the actual day of performance where you hit your peak lift, but what are you doing in your your off time to keep your body at homeostasis? Yeah, um, I mean, injury management is going to be the same way that it is for any sport. You got to train within your capacity to recover. So, you know, a lot of what Juggernaut AI app and Juggernaut BJJ app are, are built around and, and the principles we talk about with training uh, involve these volume landmarks. So we talk about MV, maintenance volume, you know, basically... And, and it's easy to contextualize volume as, you know, tonnage or sets times reps uh, or number of sets in a given intensity range. But all training, you know, can be measured that, 
you know, some better, some more simply than others. But typically when people are getting hurt, they're exceeding their body, the tissue's ability to adapt to a given load. So that could be too much volume in too short of a time, too much volume over the extended period of time. Whether that's too much jujitsu training, it's too much, you know, squatting, it's too much deadlifting, it's too much football practice, whatever it is. So maintenance volume is it's going to keep you at the same uh, uh, level that you're at right now. MEV, minimum effective volume, the smallest dose of training required to make a positive adaptation. MAV, maximum adaptive volume, you know, kind of the sweet spot of where you respond the best. And then MRV, maximum recoverable volume, uh, you know, the most training that you could recover from in a micro cycle. So, you know, if this week I squatted 500 for four by six and next week I'm able to do 500 for four by six again, I'm recovered. If I can do more, I'm recovered. If I can't, if I can't do as much, then it's, I've exceeded my recovery capacity for that, for that time period. So, you know, making sure that we're training within, you know, under MRV and then using fatigue management strategies like, you know, playing D loads or light days, Mm -hmm. sleeping enough, eating enough, that's going to be the bulk of it. And then, you know, very, very granular part beyond that is going to be the, uh, you know, massage or ice bath or, you know, other passive recovery modalities. So you're, so you're saying my, just getting a hyper ice gun and jamming my legs all day doesn't fix anything. <laughs> yeah. That's been, yeah, that's been the, a strange uh, thing to watch too. It, just it the, the rise in little. marketing, you know, marketing efforts of these companies that I, on one hand, I get it. And I appreciate it that like they brought recovery to the forefront and there's people that are thinking about taking care of their body so that they can perform. That's a net positive. But on the flip side of that, people are walking away with this idea that if you just take a cold shower and massage your calves with this percussion gun, that everything's fine. And then you can just go linearly as hard as you want all the time, incrementally adding more weight, more weight, more weight. And then they go, hey, I I blew a disc in my back or, hey, my I tore my ACL doing something super simple. Why did that happen? And it's because your understandings are skewed of how training actually works. Like getting strong is a complex thing that takes insight. Someone like yourself knows more than anybody. It's not just to add two and a half pounds every time you train every week over a week until one day you're the strongest person on the planet. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. I mean, it works for a while like that, but uh, not, not for too long. And, you know, I say all this as a person who's had micro disectomy surgery. My surgeon said that I have the record for the most herniated disc that he's ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah put, put that on your mantle, right? <laughs> so I've, I've dealt with my, my share of uh, back specifically uh, injury, but but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not overly complex, but you know, it, it, it does take a lot of effort in tracking and understanding, you know, when to pull back and discipline around around that. So with with Juggernaut AI, that the AI component is that it starts to better understand the athlete, right? The more that you utilize the software, the more you utilize the app, it starts to get where your your ability to perform at your best is, and then it helps you manage the recovery through that. Correct. Yeah. So the initial program creation is centered around taking these biological individual differences and and then some lifestyle stuff that can inform us. Does this person likely need more or less volume to improve? And are they likely capable of recovering from more or less volume? And everything, you know, the gender, age, height, weight, strength, experience, um, how much you sleep, are you trying to gain weight? Are you trying to lose weight? Do you have high away from training stress? Um, all of those things inform the system, you know, inform me as a coach and then inform inform our, our AI system. Is this person likely you know, to need more or less. So if you're, if you're big and strong, you've been training for a long time, well, you're going to need quite a bit of volume, uh, to improve because you have this big training history, but all those same things are also telling us, well, you're unlikely to be able to recover from that much. So the MEV minimum effective volume and MRV are coming pretty close to each other. And that's where you have to get more creative in, you know, fatigue management strategy compared to someone who's, you know, brand new to lifting. Right. They're not going to need a ton to improve, 
but they likely could do quite a bit of work, especially because the work they're doing is not particularly stimulating or fatiguing uh, in the grand scheme. So it's it's looking at, at all those individual differences and the relationship it creates between MEV and MRV, and that informs our volume decisions, our frequency of, of squat bench deadlift variations, how much hypertrophy do they need compared to strength, compared to peaking. Uh, so we get a lot of information from that. That's uh, that's amazing. I, how did you come up with, like, let me, I'll preface this by saying this. I've come into contact as a coach, as I'm sure you had, with tons of these offerings, lots of different programs that show or claim to provide insights into this type of thing. They can give you a program that the best online coach you'll ever have, yada, yada, yada. Just in looking at what you guys are offering, one, it's extremely professional. It's clean. And then what you're, what you're helping the person solve is a very, very crucial part of training that is commonly overlooked. How did you get to the point where this was ready to one launch and then actually start servicing people because you service competitive athletes also, it's not like this is some app where you just, you sign up and you get a 30 minute workout and you feel great. This is high level athletic programming. that's actually even helping people compete at the highest level and set records, which each one of those things is another rung on the ladder of difficulty to accomplish, especially with a deliverable like this. So what was that creation process like for you? Obviously you had the knowledge, the athletic experience, the professional experience, but to get it into a deliverable is that's challenging and expensive. Yeah, so uh, I have a great CTO, uh, Tim Arnold, who developed the, the apps and actually wrote, wrote the code. That was about a 10 month process for him working on that. Wow. Uh, prior, prior to that, you know, actually like packaging my coaching logic into, you know, something that was ready for him to code. And like from it, your brain into a, yeah, into yeah. something for him. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, in, in one way you could think of it as, it, it was about nine months of putting that together. And another way of thinking of, of it, it was about uh, 14 years, right. of my, <laughs> you know, coaching. So I started during that 2009, um, you know, mostly was in the sport performance realm. So it's, you know, and I was coaching for three years prior to that. Uh, so I started as a professional coach. I mean, getting paid to be a coach when I was 19 years old um, and just was always very interested in it. But I think where being able to create the system that is now Juggernaut AI began would have been around 2015. I was a co-author of a book called Scientific Principles of Strength Training with my friends, Dr. Mike Isretel, Dr. James Hoffman from Renaissance Periodization. And you know, they both got fancy you know, sport physiology PhDs. I have a degree in history, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get a lot of useful in these days. Yeah, they were stoked that you brought that to the table, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, they just wanted me for my good looks, but right. the uh, you know so as we as we did that book, it took a lot of what I was doing intuitively uh, as a coach, or you know had an understanding from through reading or dealing with other coaches or trial and error, and started to formalize that into these principles: specificity, fatigue management. Or, sorry, uh, sorry, specificity, overload, fatigue management, SRA, stimulus recovery, adaptation, uh, variation, phase potentiation, and individual differences. And so as I kind of formalized that understanding, I, I was able to kind of contextualize, this is why, you know, oh yes, I, I've been doing this and this is how it fits into this idea. Or, okay, as I think about this that I've been doing, I could do a better job of it because of this. Then out of that was born the, the volume landmarks MV, MEV, MAV, MRV. So I do a ton of seminars. So I did uh, 250 seminars all around the world from 2010. Uh, and then the last ones were in 2019. Um, and as I would talk about these, talk about how to design programs for, you know, the athlete themselves or talking with coaches, how to, how to individualize things for their, for their clients or their team, I would talk about those individual differences. All right, how does gender affect how much volume the athlete needs? How does the size of the athlete affect the frequency of overloading training that they're gonna that they're gonna require to improve? 
and I would go through these presentations and explain explain these ideas. And then kind of at the end still, people would be like, well, but what's my MRV? Tell, tell me my number. <laughs> and the, the principle descriptive rather than prescriptive, uh, you know, discussion was not quite enough for them. So I decided, I was like, all right, you know, I know that there is like, I know how I'm going to change a program for someone who's, you know, 40 and weighs 280 squatting 800 than someone who's, you know, 21, a 21 year old, 120 pound girl who's been lifting for six months. I know how I'm going to change the the program for that. So I just got to show other people how to do it. So I just kind of began coming up with magnitudes, like the scale of, of magnitude, like, all right, how much does gender change? You know, how much do we change for male versus female volume? And then if they're short or medium height, tall or really tall, how do we change it? And, you know, so just kind of came up with this, this big flow chart for that. And then, um, you know, just kept putting trial cases through there and refining the numbers. And, you know, it was really interesting for me. And I was also like through that process, I wrote my book, powerlifting program design manual, uh, which is, you know, not quite a paint by numbers, but, uh, but, you know, a step-by-step -step process of how to assess athletes and create programs from that, from those assessments. It was a great like mental exercise for me because I knew, well, when this goes into the app, it can't, the answer can't be because that's how I do it or that's how I've always right. done it yeah. or I feel this or I feel that. This is, this is what's going to happen and I got to own that decision. And so it was a great mental exercise for me to have to really, you know, look in the mirror at why I was making coaching decisions and dissect every set and rep and an alteration to a program that I was you know, had created for someone or would create for someone in the future, because, you know, we've got people again, from all, from all stretches. I posted a video of one of our app users this morning, squatting 825. I watched it. Yeah. He's, <laughs> it's insane. You know, he's pulled 840. <laughs> you know, we have from that all the way down to people, maybe they've been lifting for six months, you know, from, we've got 20 year olds and 70 year olds using it and it's creating something something uh, individualized for all of them. And I think part of what I want to do there is kind of reshape people's understanding of, you know, programs versus programming. Like mm -hmm. you could go, you, know, and, uh, you go by a program, like I wrote the juggernaut method back in 2010 and it's a fine program, but it's fixed. It's sets and reps right. that don't change whether you're 20 or 60, whether you're, weigh 120 or, or 320. And that's not how training should work. You know, everyone who's writing those, those programs and juggernaut method, five, three, one, you know, starting strength. Like if, it, if it's got a name that, you know, probably it's, right. it's fixed and that's written for, you know, some slice of the bell curve of, of people. And it's going to work better for some and worse for some. And it's going to be awesome for, for other people. But, as that person that it's working awesome from, as they get stronger and they get older, they get bigger, lighter, higher stress times of their life, lower stress times of their life, you know, coming back from injuries, whatever it is, their needs change, but that program doesn't, but ours right. does, it keeps adapting. So even when, you know, I do these seminars and people would ask, well, how many times a week should I squat? Which seems on its face like a very simple question. And they were hoping for a very simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not one for very simple answers, not for complex answers either, but just for, for complete answers. Right. So, you know, I would try and explain to them, well, this is why someone might need higher frequency or lower frequency. So this can be the answer for you now. Mm -hmm. It could be the answer for you when you're 20 weeks out from a meet, when you're two weeks out from a meet for you now today, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now for your training partner, for, you know, for your wife, for your son, for your daughter, whoever you're working with to understand, you know, to just go a little bit deeper and understand the principles behind that decision-making process than just saying two times a week, it's the best. Everyone should do two times right. a week. In a way, it's almost and now thinking about what you're putting together and the thought process that got in a couple of things like having 
put together, a, gone through a similar exercise of, of the difficulty of actually rolling out a, a program that selects things for someone else. You run into a lot of these, you, it's funny hearing you talk about like the thought experiment part of it, but you run into a lot of these situations where you're faced with the, the way that you thought that it would go or the outcome that you thought something would produce is different. And so you really have to think about that. You really have to go through the entire flow chart. It's like building a website and you don't realize every time you do an action, it produces a new page and that page has to be thought of. And the way back to the original page has to be thought of. And you start to actually see that websites are very complex in their design, that, although they feel simple when you look at them. But then I think about the, the future of sport utilizing something like what you're talking about becomes really useful because if you think about sports teams, right? A lot of these guys, they're running, they're scientifically smart programs, but they're running them together in big groups, but they're individual athletes. Some of them are stressed out. Some of them are in relationships. Some of them sleep alone. Some of them don't sleep. Some of them are stressed. Some aren't. Some have neurological stress. Some have injuries. All those components are extremely valuable towards making a decision on training day of what intensity you should train at. And if you have an athletic history and you have some understanding of that as you go about, you can make on the call decisions, but not everyone's equipped with that. And so it, like I've ran starting strength programs or I, I used to do uh, Greg Everett's programming for Olympic weightlifting and I would get a, a bulk 12 week program, you know, that's, that's smart. It's designed by Greg Everett. The guy knows what he's talking about. But then at the end of the day, there are a lot of times where I would have to be really dialed into like my recovery, my volume, my nervous system to then choose how to go about it. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to make that choice. But there's a reason that question is so complex. How many days a week should I squat? Yeah. And it's not to be contrarian. It's like, because the answer is actually not that simple. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, tough sometimes and you know i'm in the business of, of selling information or selling coaching selling stuff on the internet and given the complex the more complex answer isn't what big the biggest groups of people want because right they think that they care about what they're what they're doing and they do care just not as much as they think that they care. <laughs> if they really care they take the extra 10 minutes you know to to understand what i'm talking about there rather than the you know, one infographic or, you know, two times a week is the best kind of, kind of thing. And I've been surprised, you know, I do consulting for a lot of really high level coaches, professional teams and, and colleges and stuff. And the lack of understanding of that, of how individual differences impact the training. Cause you know, as, as I went through those scientific principles of strength training from our, from our book, if you do specificity overload and fatigue management, well, you know, if, if the program contains those, you have a pretty solid program. So the individual differences vary all the way down at the bottom, but what, you know, specificity is, is much more sport, sport dependent. Um, so it doesn't get impacted too much by individual differences, but what overload means for that athlete, you know, so what training is stimulating enough for them to make improvements and then the level of fatigue management that's required that starts to get impacted by it quite a bit so you know i think that there's people just they, they love to talk in in black and whites about you know like this is right this is wrong or in in training i see a lot of you know we'll see a lot of comments or like oh, everyone's out there over complicating this like you just got to train hard and add weight to the bar and sleep enough and it's like Okay, if if you you can get really good that way, but there's nothing stopping us from doing a better job of it. There's no, right. you know, there's no re there's no reason that we can't take you know our passion for for this field and go a little bit deeper to make a little bit better uh, you know decisions for people. Right. I, I mean, I guess in a way that's a good transition here because I I know we're a little bit borrowed on time, but I wanted to talk uh, about how all this information comes to life in the sport of grappling, mm -hmm. because it's, it's one where I get fielded questions all the time from people that are saying, you know, how should I be running? What, what are the best strength lifts? What lifts do I need to do? How often should I strength train? Do I even need a strength train? Should I just increase my frequency of jujitsu? Cause it's, it's specific to the sport. And one thing that when I was 
going through just like videos that you put up, something that I found really like it really hit home for me was this idea between the problem of specificity and special strength. And I think that when you have any sport that's unique, that has a lot of eyes on it, people come up with things that uh, visually, it, they, they hit like a nerve in the brain where you go, oh, that's what I do when I'm grappling. So you see someone use like uh, a gi thrown over a pull-up bar and they're doing pull-ups with their grip and they're talking to the camera about how that's going to improve their grip for jujitsu. So any other pull-up would be worthless. This is how you got to do it. And there's, you know, infinity exercises that fall into this bucket of stuff that really connects on the visual. But when you understand strength development the way that you do and the history that you have with it, you're able to separate these two things into not that one doesn't matter and one does, but maybe we can start there with this idea of specificity and special strength and what you mean by those two. Yeah. Yeah. So quick background, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I started my company in 2009. Uh, one of my first clients, um, was a gentleman by the name of Fabio Vilela Giganchino, a six foot seven, 250 pound black belt. And I kind of got him from a cold call. And then a couple of weeks later, there was more black belts and more black belts. And they talk. so since late 2009, early 2010, <clears throat> I've gotten the good fortune to serve as strength and conditioning coach for a lot of incredible grapplers, Homolo Bajau, Felipe Pena, Felipe Pena back when he was a purple belt <laughs> for a while, wow. brown belt, wow. he would be coming and visiting uh, the U.S. for like camps before Worlds and Pan Ams, uh, Victor Estima, Otavio Souza. I just had Victor on last week. Oh, nice. Great yeah. guy. Yeah. Awesome guy. Yeah. You know. All the, all these kind of really high level people, but I was never trained in jiu-jitsu then. There was, it was always just, I was doing powerlifting and strongman and they were just, hey, coach your chin, you got to train, you got to smash over your body, come on. And it wasn't all right, we need a, hold on, we need a, a completely separate podcast where you just do Portuguese accents and talk about <laughs> Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. and strength training. Uh, sorry, continue. So it wasn't until 2017 that I started training jiu-jitsu myself uh, about a year after I finished powerlifting. So since then, I've you know gained such a deeper understanding, certainly, of mistakes I made earlier in my career, what mattered, what didn't matter, um, and just to, yeah, just been able to have a, a new perspective that you can only have when you're when you're in it. Um, so to the question of specificity versus special strength, you know, specificity is developing the underlying systems of success for the sport. So that certainly changes, you know, what from sport to sport. You know, specificity is always the principle that creates a framework that all other uh, program design decisions, training decisions are made, but what the underlying systems of success are, are different. And in jujitsu, there are, even can be quite a bit different just based on the style of, of, you know, the athlete's game, a guard player versus a top player versus someone, you know, is more wrestling heavy or an explosive game, more of a lasso guard shutdown, slowdown game, it's going to, it's going to have smaller changes within that where special strength is, is, you know, ideas adapted from Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk, former, you know, national team throws coach for the Soviet Union, coached the two greatest hammer throwers of all time. Um, basically, uh, <clears throat> you know, he had, everyone thought, oh, these throwers have to be so strong. <clears throat> if you want to throw the hammer 80 meters, you need to be able to clean 200 kilos. And then he was like, I don't know that cleaning 200 kilos is that important, but how far can they throw this, you know, 10 kilo hammer instead of just the seven kilo hammer or how fast can they move the five kilo hammer? So right. their general strength and general uh, characteristics like lift, you know, main lifts that people, you know, squat, uh, squat clean type of stuff. And, and like broad jump or vertical jump kind of came down, but their special strength exercises, you know, barbell twists and throwing overweight and underweight hammers and, and that kind of thing went up and the results went up. So essentially, uh, you know, the special strength exercises are going to be exercises that mimic the direction, duration, or velocity of a sporting action but it's important to contextualize with that, that it has to overload it in some way. Right. You have to either be going, you know, producing more force or higher velocities 
in that exercise. Otherwise, just practice the sport more. Uh, and the other part that comes in, especially with a sport like grappling, where a special strength exercise can have a role as long as it's, you know, fulfilling those characteristics of mimicking direction, duration, or velocity, but overloading the force or velocity side of things, is that you might be able to, to get some extra work in the special strength exercise that if you were to just roll more, there's so many different components of stimulus and fatigue that come along with that, that it, you may be exceeding your MRV by, you know, rolling five extra rounds in a week. Right. But by doing some special strength exercise, you're able to, you know, target more of a specific deficiency without, you know, all of these kind of peripheral stimulus and fatigue that comes along with it. And so does that, that then becomes individual in the fact that those special strength exercises should be selected based on discrepancies or weaknesses in the athlete, right? So if you're going to do a, a bent over like band resistance, explosive gorilla row, that should be because you've noticed in your training that when you're over your partner and you're trying to control their sleeves, they break your grip constantly. So it should be like an applicable based on the actual sport that you're playing? Yeah, I mean, ideally every exercise is gonna be chosen pretty specifically for, for the person. You know, as individualized as, you know, my game to your game to Philippe's game behind me, you know, it could be, well, a lot of the same movement patterns still gonna happen in <clears throat> Jiu-Jitsu, but if, if you're great, you know, at something, then I probably wouldn't wouldn't be like, oh, let's do an exercise to make you, you know, to spend even more energy on this thing that you already have a surplus of ability in. Right. So if you're deciding in your week how much to do, I feel like this is a problem that a lot of people run into is jujitsu for, for the common person, it's an additional hobby or activity that they're doing to stay healthy. They Maybe they want to manage their weight. Maybe they just need an activity. They need to get away from the family. It's a couple hours a week. So it's important to separate those group of people from elite level athletes, people that are trying to compete on the European, Pan American, American schedule and, and actually be elite in their sport. But if you're the, the general population person who's trying to stay healthy, what do you say to someone like that about how to manage their output in the week between gym and cardiovascular training and training frequency of jujitsu? Yeah, so important thing to understand is that Every, everything you do, you know, uh, so Charlie Francis is kind of an infamous uh, sprint coach, Coach Ben Johnson, but he would liken the nervous system to a cup. And everything in your life is, is filling that cup up to varying degrees. The more stimulating it is, the more stressful it is, the more it fills the cup. If the cup overflows, you're overtrained. So jujitsu is stimulus, lifting is stimulus, extra conditioning is stimulus, life is stimulus you know, depending on how stressful of a life you have. And that's both physical and emotional mental stress. That could be, you know, you work a manual labor job or, you know, your boss is yelling at you all the time or you and your wife are going through problems, whatever it is, there's stress there. You're in finals at school. So all of those need to be, need to be considered. And then within that, then looking at the individual, all right, does this person need more jujitsu? to succeed, do they, so that basically they're lacking technically in jujitsu, do they need to have, you know, more, are, are they just weak and slow and, you know, they have a good understanding of the techniques, but they can't execute them effectively because of this lack of physicality. Um, you know, probably everyone can, almost everyone can use more aerobic capacity to be better at jujitsu. So, once I understand, all right, I have this finite amount of total work I can do, you know, let's call it like a hundred units of work. Where does, where does that work need to get broken up? So, uh, you know, that's, that's an important piece to it. Like I've always been surprised working with a lot of like straight from Brazil, black belts, even that they had almost no history of physical training. And this was not so common now as it would have been five years ago and 10 years ago, more people are, are lifting and getting exposed to this stuff. But especially when I started this back in, you know, 20, 2009, 2010, guys had never lifted before. Maybe push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, but just trained a lot of jiu-jitsu. 
So if there's someone who's in that category and, you know, they're a brown belt or a black belt and they've got really good technique, but they've never lifted, but they train jujitsu, you know, 12 times a week. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> low hanging fruits, to, weightlifting. <laughs> yeah. Is going to train in jujitsu nine times a week going to make their technique worse? No. Right. But if they can now add in just two lifting sessions and, and go from, you know, zero there to a, to, you know, a little bit of energy, they're going to get all those beginner gains and stuff and, and, and get a great response from that, you know, where someone on the other side of things, someone coming from my background of, you know, powerlifting or someone coming from weightlifting or CrossFit or whatever, they might have physical abilities that far outpace their jujitsu skill. So right. while they have normally been lifting four times a week and then, and, or five times a week, and, and now they start doing jujitsu, they're probably not going to be able to keep lifting four or five times a week. And they don't need to, if succeeding in jujitsu is their, is their objective. You know, they, so you describe like, me in a, in a nutshell, when I got into uh, jujitsu now a little over four years ago, I was competing in Olympic weightlifting. So I was on you know, 12 week programs where you're training for five days a week and you're trying to manage everything. And so when I added jujitsu, I was like, oh, this is fun. I'll just go, you know, play this sport. And I mean, it took all but a month before I basically pulled my hip flexor super bad from all the guard playing and then the volume from squatting and snatching and cleaning and jerking and everything. And it was like, I, I, I was at a fork in the road. I was like, what do I want to get better at? going forward? Do I want to become a more proficient jujitsu player or do I want to compete in Olympic weightlifting? Because at that point I saw that you can't be competitive at, you can be, you can use one to help. Well, you can really only use one to help the other. You can use Olympic weightlifting to help jujitsu. You can't get better at Olympic weightlifting by rolling. But I saw that if I just tried to stay at what I was doing, it was going to it was going to bite me in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a video called how heavy do you need to lift for BJJ? And, uh, you know, the being a strong weight room person as a jujitsu player, like is a pretty low bar, especially for people coming from the strength sport background. Like, let's see if I tilt this up. I'll, I'll link it too. Cause I was, I watched that the other day and we'll, we'll like, put it in the show notes. That gentleman up at the top there, Otavio yep. Souza, you top know, right, yeah, um, you know, with his with his hand up, victorious, a uh, four time Pan Am, three time world champ at adult black belt. I, you know, trained jiu jitsu with him. He's like five six, one hundred and eighty five pounds. Feels like he weighs about five hundred. <laughs> the uh, the uh, there's never been a time where I'm like, I'm overpowering him. Well, he benches you know, like 280, you know, deadlifts, trap bar deadlift about 400. I love Very how strong. you say these, you say these numbers, like you're, you're on the top of this mound, like they're so small. Cause you look, you think about like the average person thinking about weightlifting and they're like, whoa, 400 pounds. That's insane. But relative sure. this is like to your strength. The best athlete in the world, you know, if, if right. he shows up at a powerlifting meet and competes as a 181, you know, what his class would probably be and did those 400 pounds. Like here's a participation trophy for that. The, yeah, the guys who exactly. Are, the exactly. guys who are the equivalent of Otavio in powerlifting, you know, black belt ungodly numbers. Yeah. They're, they're deadlifting 700, 750, Some. you know, and he is very strong in chin-ups, like 110 pounds for three on the chin-up. Wow. But nothing that's like, you know, oh my God, this guy's so strong, but he right. feels so strong. So that, that having enough general strength and then, you know, to kind of tie this back, taking that general strength, but uh, making it specific through sport practice and, you know, the, the special strength exercise of training a bunch of jiu-jitsu, like, you know, Hamalu Bahao, like great spider guard player. Yeah. When he does this, that's an, that's an exercise. When he pulls on your sleeve and extends your arm, like he has how many times has he done that special strength exercise, you know, right. on the mat with the gi on like thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And, you know, so I, I kind of think like, like technique sport, sporting technique is what allows you to fully express your physical qualities. Like if yeah. just, if jujitsu was just a, how strong are you? I would be the best, but I'm not, right. I'm not <laughs> close, you know, cause 
my strength is getting sprayed, you know, yeah. everywhere because compared to a guy like Felipe or Otavio, who's taking theirs and focusing it and blasting you with right. it in the, in the perfect position and timing and all that, that stuff. But what but, was your, I'm very curious, just psychologically, like your, your strong as hell throughout your life. Uh, you don't start jujitsu until later. What was it like going into jujitsu being, cause there's, there's strong people that decide they want, there are athletic people that decide they want to start jujitsu all the time, but there's very few people who are globally elite at being strong the way that you are that then start and do jujitsu. Um, I, I got to plug my computer in. No, you're good. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, some of the first pieces of advice that I was given by my professor, Philippe Del Monica, who, you know, coaches all kind of high level MMA guys, TJ Dillashaw, Rafael Dos Anjos, Naaman Gracie, uh, was to train and, and I'd known Philippe for 10 years, you know, when I started training jujitsu that he told me, he's like, well, train, train like you're weak, you know, don't, don't use your strength. He said, because when you, he's like, you could just power through and, and, you know, be beating up all these white belts, but you know, what technique are you going to develop doing that? Right. So I took that advice to heart, probably even to a fault sometimes where I'm, I'm so conscious of like, Man, I'm a lot bigger and a lot stronger than everyone. So I don't want to be a dick and a bad training partner. And everyone, be like, I don't want to train with Chad. He's too, he's too he's big. He's too big, too strong. You know, so, so I, I play light a lot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, plenty of humbling times too. Like Professor Philippe is about 175 pounds and I'm going to pass his guard one day. I know, I, I know <laughs> it. You know, because now it's like, if I do pass his guard, I was like, he probably just let me. He probably wants to work some... So the mind escape, games. You know, side control, <laughs> so he just let me do it. Right. Um, but yeah, very, very humbling for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's such a, a unique. Victor and I were talking about this actually, oddly, last week. Um, it this it's such such a special art form of sport because of that. Like you, you can be someone who's 175 pounds, a black belt, or super experienced, tenured, and actually create a serious problem for someone like yourself who's big and super strong by all measures of the word. And that's a unique situation. It's very special how, how much the technicality plays into the effectiveness of what you're doing. Yeah. And I mean, just the, the feel of like these guys ability to apply their force really well, right. like you're saying, uh, Otavio feels like he's 500 pounds. The, uh, was I was getting ready for I did a, a flow grappling a who's number one like super fight back in 2020, and I was also doing combine NFL combine training. So one day I show up to to coach our our guys, all these college football players getting ready to go to the NFL, and they can tell that I'm just like, fuck, I am I am exhausted right now. Yeah. And they're like, hey, coach, what you know what happened? I said I just trained jujitsu. Like this guy, I was training with Otavio, and I was like, this guy kicking my ass. And they're like, oh man, like. You know how big and strong is this guy? He's kicking around. So it's like he's like 185 pounds, and they're just like, "What?" Yeah. And I was like, "You just, you just have to feel it. Like, there's no way to understand it until you train with with people who are just great." And yeah. you're like, "What is going on right now?" I've I've told this story a million times, so I won't do it again on on this podcast. But that was exactly what humbled me in the very beginning. Was someone? It was a fraction of my size. I had this big head about myself who I thought I was because I was competing in Olympic weightlifting. I thought I was strong, a former athlete. And this guy just put me through a clinic. I mean, absolutely flipped my world upside down on its head. And I walked out of there like I was just, I did never expected that it would be like that. And it was that feeling of how much more power they had over me through these various like body positions. Can, can you actually, given your understanding of strength and adaptation, what is happening there when someone like Octavio can feel like 500 pounds against someone like you, like on a physiological level, what's going on there? I, I mean, I guess, it, you know, lever, leverage positioning, like he just, he knows so well and, and subconsciously, he's not even, you know, I mean, I think about it at all, like what angle to put his body at and where he's putting his shoulder on your you know, on your chest and, and 
to feel all of his weight and all of his force is, is just being directed so well. I mean, I guess if I knew how to do it like him, if I knew what it right. was, I'd be able to do it too. Well, Chad, I'll, uh, I want to be respectful of your time here. Honestly, I could talk about this stuff all day. So I would love to do this again in the future. But next time, I'm going to bring a beer because I know that you're a, a beer connoisseur. And I, I meant to do it this time, but I'm not going to have a beer at 9 a.m. in the morning. So, well, so you know, something felt you, wrong about it. Pretend that it's Europe or something. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you taking the time to do this and we'll have to circle back on this stuff again in the future. Links will be in the show notes for uh, Juggernaut AI, BJJ, and anything else that you want. So we'll just send through the email there. Cool. Thank you very much, Abe. Yeah.